So Matthew chapter 6 <clears throat> says this in verse 5. And when you pray, actually, you know what? Let's go all the way to verse uh, 1. Take heed that you do not you do your charitable deeds or giving before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues <clears throat> and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Assuredly, I say to you, they already have their reward. But when you do a charitable de deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street that they may be seen of men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. And, and when you pray, go into your room. When you have shut your door, pray to your father who's in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So all of this is motives, right? So he's talking about motives, 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 motives. He's talking about motives when you pray, motives when you give. And he goes on eventually, he's going to go into motives of when you fast. But as you keep going, it says, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they'll be heard of their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, do not, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. And if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you yours. So here, Jesus begins to talk about in what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's actually the disciples' prayer, but we call it the Lord's Prayer. It's supposed to be our prayer. <laughs> and so as he does, he brings up a couple of things that are really interesting. And this is what the Holy Spirit began to deal with me about uh, this morning. And so the Holy Spirit began to deal with me about the last three words or the last few words in verse 13, where it says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. That's what the Lord began to speak to me about for this morning, the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen. So here he begins to speak about the kingdom, the power and the glory. And interesting because the New Testament is riddled with the message of the kingdom. Jesus preached more on the kingdom than he did heaven and hell and any other subject. He preached on the kingdom. He opened his ministry with the message of the kingdom. He ended his ministry. And even in Acts chapter 1, if you want to go there, I'll show you something. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 1, Jesus has died and is risen from the dead. And he's about to be seated at the right hand of Father. And it says, the former... Uh, uh, Acts 1, 1, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach until the day that he was taken up and he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse 3, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, speaking of things pertaining to what? Uh, kingdom. So the very last thing Jesus ever preached on was the kingdom. He started it, he ended it. And then the disciples picked up on that. And all throughout the book of Acts, it goes on and talk about all through the book of Acts, that's what they preach. They preach the message of the kingdom. As you end the book of Acts in, in, in Acts 28, go to Acts 28. Acts 28, the last two verses says, then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all that came to him preaching what? The kingdom, the kingdom of God. And teaching the things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence and no one 
forbidding him. So that was his message, the rule of God. That's probably a word we would use more than kingdom because we're not a kingdom. Uh, uh, America's not a kingdom, we're, we're a republic. People say we're a democracy. No, we're not, we're a republic. <laughs> and to this republic do I stand. You understand? I mean, it's right in the Pledge of Allegiance. We're a republic, we're not a dem democracy, you understand? So we're a republic. And so, but a republic functions different than a kingdom. A kingdom has a different operation. A kingdom has one ruler. Guess who it is? The king, right? The king has, is the king of the kingdom, right? And, and so Jesus is the king of our kingdom, right? And so he's the kingdom, a king of the kingdom of light. And so, so many people ask me about revival. What is this? revival and one person wanted to argue with me about revival in New York. <laughs> he said, well, he was a pastor. He wanted to argue about revival. Well, revival's not even mentioned in the Bible. And I said, the word Bible is not mentioned in the Bible either. How about that? Put that in your pipe and smoke it. I said, pulpit is not in the Bible. I said, worship team is not in the Bible. A pews are not in the Bible. I mean, where do you want me to stop? You want me to continue? He got lower and lower and lower and lower as I went on. So I said, there's many things that are not in the Bible, but the general premise or the idea is in the Bible. Come on, right? So there are many things that are not in the Bible, but there are things that are, we just use the word revival to describe an event. That's what we do. We just use that word to describe event. So what is a revival? A revival is a manifestation of the presence of God amongst people. It's a manifestation. It's a manifestation of the kingdom and the power and the glory converging all at once. It's God's kingdom, his authority, his rule and reign, converging with his power, converging with the very glory of God, all manifesting on the earth. <laughs> Come on, amen. That's what it is. It's when the kingdom of God begins to come upon the earth in that time. Wow. That's exactly what it is. Wow. Jesus said, your kingdom, what? Come. come. Your will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. You know, the Bible talks a lot about heaven and earth. This connection between heaven and earth, heaven and earth, heaven and earth. And did you know that the Bible actually speaks more about the earth than it even does heaven? Now, you would actually think by most preachers preaching that it's the opposite. But actually, the Bible talks much more about earth. Why? Because God's got you here. He's not trying to get you out of here. God's ultimate goal is not to get you out of here. God's ultimate goal is to get you in here. Why? So that you could bring his kingdom, his rule and reign, come on, somebody, into the earth. Jesus said that the kingdom, what he said, what's the kingdom of God like? The kingdom is like... He said, a woman took a little bit of leaven and put it in the lump, and it leavened the whole lump, right? He didn't say he took it out. He said he put it in, right? So that's God's goal. God's goal is not to get you out. You know, many people, they spend their whole lives thinking about getting out. I can't wait to get out. I can't wait to get out of here. I can't. And it's like, well, then come right now. We'll lay hands on you. We'll send you right now today, you know? <laughs> Come on, right? That's not God's ultimate goal. God's ultimate goal is to get the kingdom of God to manifest in the earth. Because guess what? There's a whole lot of people right now in Rochester need to be saved. Come on. I said there's a lot of people that need to be Come saved, on. right? That's right. So, so we've got a job to do. So what, what do we pray? Ah, we pray this. We pray, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? We want to see the manifestation of the kingdom, that rule and reign of God. I remember I, you just saw in that video, we were ministering in Florida. And uh, as we were ministering in Florida a few years ago, uh, we had these revival meetings in this church. And oh man, it was, it was a battle, let me tell you. Now your pastor loves revival, but there's a lot of pastors that don't love revival. Pastor Tony, he loves revival, right? But there's a lot of pastors that don't. I know that sounds crazy to you, but for some reason, God loves to send me to those churches. And it's like, God, I, why do you always make me go in and have to crack skulls like this? I don't want to have to crack skulls like this, Lord, you know? So I go to this church, and they were deacon-possessed, let me tell you. 
And I'm in this church in Fort Lauderdale area. And so I'm in this church and I'm like, God, what in the world am I doing here? And this is crazy. I mean, this thing just needs to be bulldozed and start over again. I mean, it's just such a mess of religion. And uh, uh, so this guy, this real big guy comes. He's a, uh, he was a deputy sheriff. Big old guy, came back from the Afghanistan war and went into law enforcement and was quickly promoted and became a deputy sheriff there in Fort Lauderdale. And unbeknownst to me or anybody else other than his wife, he was suicidal. And there, the, these, these you know, people are arguing about religion in the church and it's just a religious thing and stuff. It's just a form and... and uh, so, I mean, here I get there, my wife and I are there and we're like, oh Lord, what in the world are we doing here? And, and so the first night it was like, it was just like God just had me, I had to break through and just to stir up a hunger in the people's hearts. And uh, the guy came and he was like, man, I never heard a crazy preacher like this. I got to come again. <laughs> and so he came again. And uh, so he came again the next night, but the next day he was so depressed he actually had a gun on him. And he, told, he, he, he said to himself that morning, he, excuse me, that evening, he said, I'm going tonight and at, right after the service, I'm gonna go shoot myself. Wow. That's what he said to himself. I'm gonna kill myself at the end of the service. And so that night, the power of God hit the place. I mean, the kingdom of God was so manifested in that house, it was amazing. And uh, I was just calling people out prophetically you know, you, you come, you come, you come, you come, you come. And I see this guy in the last row with his wife. I mean, you can't miss him. He's six, six. Okay. You're not going to miss this guy, right? He's the biggest guy in the church. And the guy stands up, grabs his stuff that he had with him. And his wife, he goes, come on, let's go. I go, you sir, come right now. He goes, no, we're going to go. I said, no, you're going to come, come right now. <laughs> and so he comes down to the front, God's honest truth. He tells it everywhere now, but uh, I, I went and I laid hands on him and the power of God hit him. Wham! I mean, he was so big, he knocked both ushers down. <laughs> they were trying to stand like this. I mean, how are you going to be a catcher like this? Right. You're going to catch a 300 pound, six foot six man with your eyes shut. Like, I mean, come on, how dumb can you get and still breathe? <laughs> Anyways, long story short. He falls down, knocks down both ushers with him, and he lays there on the floor laughing his head off, weeping and laughing for about two hours in the presence of God. He's laying there on the floor screaming and laughing his head off at the same time. After that time, he got up, and that's when they took some of those pictures of, of me and stuff with him, and, and he gave a testimony about how he was gonna kill himself. He said, this is the first time since I went to the war that I've not been depressed. And, and he was healed that night and, and that was about four years ago and he's never had a drop of medication since. <laughs> totally healed, totally healed of that depression. I'm telling you what, the only thing that can set people free of depression is the presence of God, Come on. right? It's that incoming kingdom of God, that power of God that hit him. Go over to, uh, go over to your left, go over to, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, over to 1 Corinthians, um, excuse me, to your right, 1 Corinthians 4. So we talked about the kingdom, the kingdom of God. I challenge you, go through the Bible and circle every time you see the word kingdom. You'll be shocked in the New Testament how many times it talks about it constantly. I think it's 74 references to the kingdom. It's a, I mean, astronomical amount of times. But in 1 Corinthians chapter, oops, I was there, chapter 4, verse 20 says, For the kingdom of God is not in word only, but in? but in power. So there the two words are mixed together. There's several times in the scripture you'll see a combination of these three words, the kingdom, the power, and the glory. So here he says this, he said, listen, the kingdom is not in word, uh, excuse me, the kingdom of God is not just in word, but it's in power, it's in demonstration. That's the only thing that's gonna get people set free. Come on, somebody. You know, the, the thing that's gonna win Muslims to Christ is the power of God. <laughs> The thing that's going to win Hindus to Christ is the power of God. 
Now, now in, in America, we've got everything real nice and clean and stuff like that. But you go to some of these other countries, you go and you start dealing with witch doctors and stuff, and they'll laugh at that stuff. Are you hearing me? That's why the secret sensitive church doesn't work outside of America. Because they're powerless. They have no power at all in their ministry. They have no demonstration, no miracles, no signs and wonders at all. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> we go and we've ministered in places. We've ministered in, in Uganda when Muslims came with machine guns and machetes. <laughs> we've been there. <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> I mean, you're all prayed up. Trust me at that time. I promise you. Are you with me? I mean, they, they want to see a demonstration of the power. They came and they brought their children. They said they brought their kids. Uh, they brought 15 deaf children to us. They, they said, heal our kids or we'll kill you. Wow. Come on, right? That's not the time for word only. I said, that's not the time for word. You better have power. <laughs> Amen. You better function in power. I have a friend who next week we're going to go do this conference, this Supernatural Discipleship Conference in Virginia. And he's got a ministry called Just Obey Jesus and JustObeyJesus.com. And this guy goes into all kinds of different nations. Uh, he won't even give his real legal name so that he can get into those countries. We, we, we had his legal name on the, on the conference graphic. And he said, quick, take it off. He said, please, I can't have that out there because the Islamic nations and the Hindu nations, they won't let me in. So he, he just went and uh, uh, he, he ministered the last two and a half years in Jerusalem, lived right in the heart of Jerusalem because everyone said to him, said, uh, uh, you know, will this work in Jerusalem? And he, he began to minister to people, the power of God. And that's how he got people saved, the power of God. Listen, to convert a Jew from Judaism of centuries of people following Judaism, it's not going to be just a prayer. It's got to be power. Right. Are you with me? And then he did the same thing with Muslims, with the Muslims. It had to be the power of God. It had to be a demonstration for a Muslim to leave Islam and to follow Jesus Christ. And they were baptizing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them to Jesus. Come on, somebody. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. Come on. Amen. Praise God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look in chapter 2. For I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with the excellency of speech or of wisdom, just declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with just persuasive words of what? Human wisdom, right? But it was in what? Demonstration, Demonstration of the spirit and of? And the power of God. Verse 5. Look at verse 5. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the, power of God. in the power of God. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in God's power manifesting. Amen. Go over to uh, your left. Go over to the book of Psalms. Psalms. Hallelujah. We could give you hundreds of testimonies of, of, of God's power ministering to people. I mean, of, of all kinds of backgrounds. I, I remember ministering one time to this uh, Muslim guy. He's, I mean, he was Muslim. His family was Muslim as far back as he could think. This is up in Toronto. And, and I ministered to this guy with a broken spine. And prayed for this guy. And he was radically healed. He completely gave his life to Jesus. I mean, he burned his, you know, Koran. And I mean, it was, it was, you know, very demonstrative. I mean, he went and gave, radically gave his life to Christ. He's now the deacon of the church. How about that? Come on, somebody. <laughs> Amen. Changed his name and everything. He didn't want that Islamic name. Hallelujah. So Psalm 63, look in Psalm 63. Did I say that or no? Oh, okay. So Psalm 63. That your faith should not just be in the wisdom of men, but in the demonstration of the power. That's why he said the kingdom, the power, and the glory, right? And so, and that's, 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 the, that's the message of the church. The kingdom, the power, and the glory. So Psalm 63, O God, you are my God, and early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, and my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. 
So I've looked for you in the sanctuary to see your what? And your glory, right? So there we see a combination of the two again, to see the power and the glory of God, right? Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. Thus will I bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul will be satisfied with marrow and fatness and the, uh, my mouth will praise you with joyful lips and I remember you and I meditate on you in the night watches, etc. But here he talks about the, the, the power and the glory. The power and the glory. That's the only thing that's going to save America is a demonstration of the kingdom, the power and the glory. It's the only thing that's going to penetrate the hearts of these young people today. Are you with me? Yep. I mean, I thank God for, you know, all, all these different, you know, methods and stuff. I praise God for all of it. I really honestly do. And, you know, but most of the time, these kids are not impacted anymore. Most of the time, they're, 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 they just sit there blinking their eyes. Why? Because Hollywood can do a better production than church can. Come on, right? The Hollywood can do a much better production than the church can. And, and so, so the only thing that's going to reach these young people is a demonstration of, of, of the power and the right. presence of God. That's, right. that's the only thing that's going to do it. It's the only thing that's going to reach gang members and all of these different things. That's the only thing that's going to do it is, is a demonstration of it. So uh, if you go over to your right, go over to Psalms 145. Some of you know my testimony, but I'll just share it with you if you don't. But, you know, my testimony is, is that I went and I gave my heart and life to Jesus um, many years ago. My story was I grew up in a dead religious Lutheran church, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. <laughs> you know, the, I grew up in Minnesota, so we have a saying in Minnesota, there's more Lutherans than people. Some of you will get that on the way home, but so, I mean, I grew up in that. I mean, there, everybody's Lutheran. I mean, the dog is Lutheran even. I mean, they, they just sprinkle water in anything, any, you know, anything just to call it Lutheran, you know? And so, so here I was Lutheran, but I was, you know, not born again. I wasn't born again, lit candles and stuff and candles lit and all of this stuff and water sprinkled on me as a baby, but my heart was still anti-God. And, and I was rebelling against God and I was rebelling against anything I saw. And God spoke to a man to come to my little town and start a Bible study for teenagers. And so God spoke to this guy. Come, and he came a long ways away and he, he didn't even want to do it. He's like, God, I don't even like teenagers. You know? <laughs> and so he came anyway. And so he started this Bible study for teens. And I, I, I began, my friends and I, we, we persecuted him. Man, and we, we made it rough for him. We destroyed their Bibles and we ripped up their Bibles. We ripped pages out of their Bibles and, and uh, we, we went and took their worship music and Christian cassettes they had and we recorded demonic music over it. I mean, I was wicked, man. I wasn't a nice boy, you understand? And they went and the, the youth pastor began to say, teach on prayer one Wednesday night because we didn't have a spirit-filled church in my town like this. We didn't have this. And so uh, all they had was this Bible study. And so the youth pastor began to challenge the kids to pray for the worst sinner in the high school. <laughs> and so about four days later, I, I saw one of them. I was in, in this other town and I was getting in trouble as always. And so I was in this other town and I see this guy from my high school. I thought, all right, I got to go greet this guy. And so we were chasing these girls and stuff. And so anyway, so I went and I shook his hand. <laughs> <laughs> and so I shake his hand and so as I shake his hand, I, he went and he just grabbed my hand and wouldn't let me go. He just said, Tom, he said, you're going to hell. Pray this prayer. <laughs> okay. Now I do not advocate that kind of evangelism. All right. But it was just like, I call it like the ministry of the ball peen hammer. Just wham, you know, and just, I mean, I was just hit. I felt the presence of God. I mean, the power and the presence of God standing in the middle of the dotted yellow line of the street. I received Jesus. August of 1982. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. And I remember rubbing my arms. I'm like, man, I feel funny. I, I, some, that guy did something to me. I don't know what he did. You know, <laughs> I felt different. I didn't want to curse anymore. I mean, everything changed in just 
a second. Yes, yes, yes. Everything changed. What was it? It was the, the kingdom and the presence and the power of God that was in manifestation. That's right, right. Amen. That's right. And began to disciple me. He began to train me up and began to minister to me and take me to this Bible study and begin to, I began to grow in the Lord, you know. And, uh, but I began to start to see the manifestation of the presence of God, the glory of God. That's what the glory of God is. The glory of God is a manifestation of God's power. It's just like a cloud. The Bible calls it in the Old Testament like a cloud, right? What is that? It's an accumulation of moisture. Isn't that what a cloud is? It's accumulation of moisture, right? And guess what? The same thing is true with the glory of God. It's accumulation of the presence of God that's released at a specific time. Come on, come on. Right? (laughs) That's what it is. That's what the glory of God is. It's just an accumulation. Just like in the Old Testament, it came like a cloud. Well, it's an accumulation. It's an accumulation of, of, uh, you know, um, the presence of God. And, And then it began to come into services and things like that as well. We see it in the New Testament. We see Jesus, the Bible says, he went up in the cloud and took the disciples with him. And the Bible says he was transfigured before them. Well, what was that? That was the glory of God. Amen. Amen. So in Psalms 145, look here. Starts to praise the Lord in verses one and two. And not every day I'll bless you. And uh, uh, then he picks up in verse five. I'll meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and your wondrous works. And men will speak of your might and awesome acts. And I'll declare your greatness and they'll utter the memory of your great goodness and sing of your righteousness. The Lord is is gracious and full of compassion and slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works will praise you, O Lord, and your saints will bless you. Now watch this. And they'll speak of your glory of your kingdom and they'll talk of your power. They'll speak of the glory. Remember, Jesus said, how did he end the prayer? For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Right? How does he say it here? The the people of God, the the people of God will begin to speak of the glory of God, the glory of the kingdom, and they'll begin to talk of your power. I'll tell you what, when we just talk of the power of God, it begins to manifest. I said, when you just begin to talk about it, it begins to manifest. Amen. As you just begin to talk of the kingdom, as you talk of the, the gifts of the spirit, they start to manifest. <laughs> I mean, I could give you hundreds of testimonies. I remember this one time we were ministering in, in Tampa. And afterwards, the pastor said, let's go out and get something to eat after service. And it was on a, on a night service. And I, I don't normally like to do that. <laughs> Cause it just kind of sits in your gut like a rock, you know? And so, and then if you do that every week after so long, you start to have to, yeah. You know. Anyways. So, uh, I, I went on out with them. We went to Denny's and so it was about 11 o'clock at night. We went to Denny's. So as we go to Denny's, we went and, and, uh, the waitress came over. And so the, I see the waitress limping. And so as the waitress is limping, I said to her, I said, Hey, what's wrong with your leg? And she said, oh, I went and I fell and I hurt my leg. And so I went and I prayed for her and God touched her and she was freaking out. (laughs) She started freaking out. She goes, oh my gosh, she said, it doesn't hurt anymore. So we thought it it kind of was over with. She goes into the kitchen. She starts bringing people out who need prayer. (laughs) She's bringing cooks and stuff who need to get healed. And and then she brings out the manager. The manager comes out. And we prayed for the manager and the manager got touched and rededicated her life to Christ. And wow. it was amazing right there in Denny's. And so we got up to leave. And as we got up to leave, we went to walk out. And the guy that was with me, uh, young evangelist, he said, uh, Tom, he goes, look at that. Look at that table over there. They watched you the whole time you were praying for those people. I said, well, let's go over and talk to them. <laughs> so I just walked over and it's easier to get forgiveness and permission. So I just went and I sat down right in their table. They were like, okay, hi. <laughs> you know, so they were shocked. I just plopped down with them. So as I plopped down with them and I just began to say, hey, wasn't that amazing what was happening over there? And they're like, yeah, what was that? And the, the, the lady goes, the hair on my arm just stood straight up when you did that. I said, you know what that was? She said, what? I said, that was the presence of Jesus. And when I said that, tears leaked to her eyes. She was a backslider. 
and the presence of God, I, I began to minister to her. And uh, as I was ministering to her, she went and rededicated her life to Christ. I prayed for her. She got healed right there in the restaurant. She was hugging on me. You can see the whole video on my YouTube channel if you want to see it. I mean, someone caught the whole thing on video. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Manifestation of That's the right. kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. Amen. That's what revival is. That's what revival is. That's what happened in... 1995, many people don't know this, the biggest American revival in history happened in your lifetime. Do you know that? Wow. Bigger than Charles Wesley and John Wesley. Bigger than that, theirs. Bigger than the revivals of the 1800s with Finney happened in your lifetime. Just right down in Pensacola, Florida. The biggest revival ever in American history. Five million visitors in seven years. That's a lot of toilet paper. <laughs> Five, I mean, that's how, that's how preachers think. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of toilet paper we gotta buy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You imagine five, could you imagine right here to Indiana, five million visitors? Yes, I can imagine. I mean, could you even imagine one million people? Can you imagine a million visitors? Yes. I promise you, you're never gonna get your same chair back. I promise you, you won't sit in your same seat. Come on, right? I mean, m my friends down there in Missouri, they, they went and they, they had gone to the Pensacola Revival and God saved the ministry. The pastor was gonna leave his wife. The pastor was gonna quit the ministry. He was so discouraged. And uh, he went down to Pensacola and God touched him and set him free and they came back and, and revival just hit the church. Just, he began to talk of the power of God. He began to talk of the power of God. And people who had been bored with church for years that would come late and leave early, God touched him right there in the service. Come on, somebody. And a revival broke out in April of 1996 in that church. In April of 1996 in a town of 532 people that didn't even have a stop sign. The town didn't even have a Coke machine. There was not even a gas station. You had to get gas before you got to town. That's how tiny that town was. Can you imagine? And the services would swell to 2,800 people a night in a town of 532 people. Come on, somebody. Say, Lord, let it come here. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Could you imagine? 2,800 people a night. They had to connect the, the sanctuary, excuse me, the, the gymnasium to the sanctuary. And they had to run, uh, uh, what do they call that, closed caption and closed circuit and stuff from room to room. They had like five overflow rooms. <laughs> when, they, when the worship would start, did you ever go down? Yeah. When the worship would start, the floor would bow. Ask your pastor, he'll tell you. You could feel the floor moving as... Can you imagine 2,800 people jumping at one time? Can you imagine? Now, I'm not talking about a concrete floor. I'm talking about a wooden floor. <laughs> and and uh, it was amazing. But not everybody wanted the revival. Many people in the town were mad about the revival. They wanted them to leave. They didn't want the revival. <laughs> Come on. That's the same thing is true today. Many church people, they, they don't want revival. They want nice, short church. What time does it get over with? That's the first question. <laughs> they just got here. Can you imagine going to the movie theater and saying, what time does this get over? Right. Nobody says that, do they? Yeah. They want to get their money's worth. Isn't that true? Yeah. Nobody goes into a movie and says, what time does it get over with? Nobody does. The only place they do that is church. church. Why? Because their hearts aren't here. The hearts are somewhere else. And that's why we need revival. We need revival in the church so that people want to be in God's presence. Now, I've said this for years. If you don't want to be with God now, why do you want to live with him forever? I mean, I'm not the brightest bulb of the bunch here, but if you don't like me enough to hang with me now, why do, you, why do I want you to come move in with me forever? I mean, how dumb can you get and still breathe? I mean, that's just stupid. <laughs> Kenneth Hagin used to say, that's just ignorance gone to seed. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Many people, it's too loud in there. Yeah, but you're, you go home and you flip the television so loud the neighbors can hear it. How come that doesn't bother you? <laughs> 
Oh, man, keep preaching, brother. I will. Thank you so much for the encouragement there. Sorry, I just had to encourage myself for a second there. <laughs> come on, right? So, I mean, often a revival is messy. People will come not dress nice. I'm telling you, they're not going to come dress churchy. <laughs> come on. There, were, there was a, a guy from Pensacola at the revival, and he was a cab driver. And during the Pensacola revival, as the revival went on, one night he, he, had, to, he had to work at night. And he was mad. He was like, Lord, I, I want to be there at the revival. And so he had to go pick somebody, uh, these girls up at the airport. They contacted the cab company. And he said they were very, very scantily dressed. And so uh, they get in the cab, and he said they already smelt of marijuana and stuff and, and, and booze. And, and so... Uh, he said, they get into the cab and they said, take us to the wildest party in all of town. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. He said, really? It's, they said, yep, we want a party tonight. So he said, all right. <laughs> so he took him to the revival. You ever heard that story? He took him to the revival and they pull up in front of the church and this is what they said. They said, no, we said a party, not a funeral. Oh, oh. That's all they thought of the church, was yeah, you know what I mean? They said, we want a party. That's what we want a party. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, it's Friday night. If you go in there and you just sit down for 15 minutes and you come back out in 15 minutes, if you come back out in 15 minutes, I'll take you anywhere you want for free for three days. Wow. Saturday, Sunday, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They said, you're on. They said, 15 minutes. He goes, 15 minutes. That's all I ask. You go in, sit down for 15 minutes, and then you come out. <laughs> they went in there and sat down, and the power of God froze them to the seat. They couldn't move. And both of them went and fell on the altar and got born again that night. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. The glory, the kingdom, and the power. Amen. That's why the Bible says we'll talk of his power. We'll talk of his power. And I tell you what, we ought, it ought to be on the lips of God's people. Talk of his power. The Bible talks about that many times. They'll talk of his power. There's something about when you talk of God's power and you begin to remember the, the times you've seen God's power, the times you've seen miracles, signs and wonders, whatever. As you just talk about it, it's you begin to stir it in the atmosphere. You begin to stir it in the grocery store. You begin to stir it in the restaurant. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Amen. Just begin to talk of it. You just begin to tell stories. You know, there was a, an atheist that went down there to the Pensacola Revival and, and uh, he went there to go mock. He and his friends, they just went there and they just shook their head during the service and stuff. And, and the worship was done. The preaching was done. And then they were going to pray for people. And so these these four or five guys went and kind of scooted along the wall to get out of the way for people to come for prayer. <laughs> and, uh, and, and when that happened, the power of God began to swirl in that place just like a tornado. And the one lead guy, <laughs> apparently uh, Steve Hill saw the thing. The guy testified to it later, but Steve Hill saw it, but they never caught it on video, unfortunately. But the power of God picked him up and stuck him about that high off the ground. He believes in the angel of the Lord picked him up and just pinned him there for five minutes. He was held up. His feet were four feet off the ground. Boy, that'll clear your sinuses real quick. I mean, this guy fell and he was born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. Amen. There's something about just talking of his power. He's just talking of, of the, the signs and wonders. I mean, I could tell you of hundreds of times of of even in our own ministry where we've just seen revivals break out. And the one picture was when I was ministering in Sarnia, Ontario, Canada. And we had a revival break out there in April of 2006. April of 2006, we had this crazy revival breakout. And God began to move. We had six deaf people here in one service and it just kind of exploded. And as that began to take place, uh, uh, the joy of the Lord hit the place and everybody was just laughing uncontrollably, right? And, and that's not common among, you know, a lot of Canadians and stuff, you know? So 
at that time. And so, but the glory of God hit this Pentecostal church, right? It was uh, more like an assemblies of God, we would call it here. And uh, so everybody's laughing and stuff like that. Just crazy, crazy uh, things began to happen. We had so many hundreds of testimonies. One young man came and he had a, 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 um, like a terminal um, a stomach condition. Young man, like 23, 24, he was going to die. And uh, he, could, he couldn't use the restroom for four months. And uh, he, he was in excruciating pain. He came and the power of God hit this guy. He was healed, totally delivered. Uh, now he's in the ministry today. I mean, God touched this guy. I mean, I could tell you of, of emotional things. I could tell you of depression. I could tell you of hundreds of different things like this along this lines of one after another after another, people being delivered of demons and all kinds of, not just there, but in other places that we've gone and, 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 and ministered. And we've just seen where God has, you know, put body parts back that weren't even there. I remember this one time we were in a church and um, I, I was ministering to people and, and it was just a, a, a joy night. And, but I said, we're going to pray for everyone's healing that needs healing. And, and I came to this woman that was in a wheelchair and I just... <laughs> I just tapped her on the head, be healed in the name of Jesus. Now, normally I would take more time, but that night I just didn't feel led to. So I just touched her on the head and just kept on going. And so as I did, she was so mad at me. She cussed at, she cut on the way out. She cussed, she cussed me. Yeah, cause she, cause I didn't take more time to pray for her to be healed, right? So, so she, the whole way home, she cussed me. She cussed me to her husband the whole way home. I can't believe that preacher, you know, came and didn't even take more time. He took more time with the other people, but what about me and blah, blah, blah. Wow. So she was so mad that night, she went to bed, right? So she went to bed that night and she woke up in the middle of the night. She had drank too much coffee and so she had to go to the bathroom. And so she said, I'm in the bathroom doing my thing. And she said, and I'm thinking, man, that irritates me still about last night. And all of a sudden she thought for a second, she's like, wait a minute, I didn't use my wheelchair to get in here. <laughs> and she starts crying because she realizes she jumped up and walked into the restroom. God healed a cussing believer right there in the church. How about that? Right? Amen. I mean, hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Everyone say, talk of his power. Talk of his power. <laughs> hallelujah. Praise God. There's something about, we talk of the power. We stir the power up. I remember we were, we were ministering in Finland. Woo, man, those people, I'm telling you, they, they can be stoic. If you look up stoic in the dictionary, it will show you a picture of a Finnish person. All right, let me tell you. And so here we are ministering in Finland. Ay, ay, ay. We went there. And it looked like I was reading out of the, you know, as I was ministering all week, it looked like their, their facial expressions were like I was reading out of the Encyclopedia Britannica or something. I mean, nothing, just staring at you, just like a frog in a hailstorm. I mean, just nothing. <laughs> just like that. The whole night. The, I'm like, I don't think anything's getting through. I think the interpreter's talking another language or something, you know. And so... Um, so afterwards, it came prayer ministry time. Man, they jumped in the river. God touched and ministered and stuff. And, and uh, I remember my wife was ministering to this one woman, and the joy of the Lord hit her. And when the joy of the Lord hit her, she started manifesting demons. We got a photo of it. I don't think I put it up there. We got a photo of it, and she began to levitate off the ground. She got about two feet high off the ground. <laughs> my wife was like, in the name of Jesus. My wife pushed her right straight to the floor. <laughs> And cast the devil out of this woman and she was delivered and speaking in tongues and twirling and dancing. And I mean, the Lord just did an amazing thing. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Talk of his power. Praise the Lord. The kingdom, the power and the glory. And so, Lord, we thank you right now for this week, for all the things that you're going to do.